there's a family of possums in here. I call the, I call big, the big one, one Bitey. Yes. <laughs> one of the biggest ways to tell an older Simpsons episode apart from a modern one is how it looks. It's a cartoon, obviously the visuals are given a lot of thought, and everyone involved wants it to look as appealing and presentable as they can, but it hasn't always been that way. Over the three and a half decades The Simpsons have been on TV, they've seen animators, directors, and entire studios come and go. Everyone knows how to draw Homer and Bart now, and Marge and Lisa if they're extra talented, but there had to be a foundation, and Tracy Ullman's funky new sketch comedy was the perfect place to lay it. When Americans first laid eyes on The Simpsons, they were a work in progress. The creator, Matt Groening, doodled them at the last minute before a pitch meeting, and their adventures only lasted 60 to 90 seconds. They were all animated at Klasky Shupo and overseen by animator David Silverman, who over time tweaked their designs to make them rounder and cuter. After three seasons of The Tracy Ullman Show, they looked much closer to how we expect, but still moved very differently. Their environment was rough and amorphous, side characters were either simple concepts or millhouse. In my opinion, the proper finale to the Tracy Ullman era was never aired on television. It was the pilot for the main series, the original cut for Some Enchanted Evening. There was some regression and a lot of miscommunication, since they were outsourcing the animation for the first time to the Korean studio Acom. Some of this survives as a DVD extra, but most of it was cut and replaced with better footage, with director Kent Butterworth leaving the show soon after to work on other cartoons with way less inconsistent looking first seasons. I don't know what else to do. With the main show's premiere in 1989, the evolution of The Simpsons art style was still in effect. They had way more characters to use, way more locations to visit in Springfield, Southern Missouri, and a much longer runtime to deal with each week. And they had more directors to get on the same page. David Silverman gets a lot of credit for making The Simpsons look the way it does, but there were plenty of other directors here besides him and Kent, like Wes Archer, Rich Moore, and Brad Bird and they all collectively pushed for a more dramatic look with realistic scene composition to complement the more emotional stories the main show was dishing out compared to the comic strip-esque Ullman shorts. But everyone's favourite thing about season 1 today isn't the stories or the heart or the more innocent and grounded character writing. It's how funky the side characters look. And not just the regulars we know today having design quirks that would be ironed out with time, there's a lot of faces in season 1 we've hardly, if ever, seen again. They vary in quality, but each one has its own fan base, and rightfully so. How can one little insulated wire bring so much happiness? The Simpsons was a hit from the beginning, Bart Mania, teachers loved it, you all know the story. So season 2 was given a sharp budget and episode increase. This could have gone great or horribly, and it's to our relief that season 2 was far better than the first in every conceivable way. The revamped opening isn't just a classic TV intro, it's a statement of intent to keep the ball rolling and push for more life and detail. The writers were filling the scripts with more satire and pop culture references, which gave the animators more to accomplish and more ways to play with the art style. Mark Kirkland and Jim Reardon made their directorial debuts here, and eventually became stalwarts, bringing some of the best episodes of the series into being. For one reason or another, quirks would enter the picture, but would be ironed out with time. Remember when Homer's hair was round? Be careful, David Silverman doesn't want you to. But a bit of trouble came back when season 3 entered production. Why here? This is how you expect all the characters and locations to look now, right? Well, for the directors, it was the eyes. Those damn eyes. Due to the rising costs at ACOM, they only worked on 14 of the 24 episodes in Season 3, one of which, when Flanders failed, was already a problem child held back for revisions. The other 10 were outsourced to another Korean studio, Anavision. They got 99% of the art style down pretty quickly, but directors were annoyed with how big they made the characters' pupils. You see, the show had developed a very long and detailed style guide across the first two seasons, and any diversion was a no-no. The bad news is, it took Anavision until season 6 to stop making the pupils so big, 
But the good news is, they still had the best looking animation style of the whole show. They must have taken the memo hard because sometimes they made the eyes smaller than usual. And stop staring at me with them big old eyes! <laughs> Big eyes or no, they followed the spirit of Silverman's guidelines, that these characters were designed to be mindless Americans creating mayhem for themselves, and most of your favourite faces and reactions of the classic era were in episodes they animated. But they weren't going to be the new studio for long. Dear Lord, may your loving hand guide Homer to the mattress square and true. Season 4 brought many stylistic changes to the show that continue to impact the creative decisions it makes today. Zania storylines, wackier actions, and a new domestic production studio, Film Roman. Klesky Shupo's hands were starting to get a little full with Rugrats, and the Simpsons writers were getting more playful with the world of Springfield. Along with the home of Bobby's world, a third overseas studio would now be handling the animation work, Rough Draft Korea. Fun fact, Rough Draft Studios was founded by a former Simpsons director, Greg Vanzo. And what a lucky life he's lived, given how many iconic cartoons have been animated by Rough Draft at one point or another. Rough Draft wasn't given that many episodes of The Simpsons to work on at first, only five during the first half of season four, just in case they weren't cut out for it. But the staff had few problems with how the finished products turned out. Sure, Homer's hair is really big, but that's between you and me. Now that there are three overseas studios animating the show, the show's future was secure. While they each brought something different to the look of the show, with Acom clearly having the most experience up to now, viewers were none the wiser. For all they knew, big hair, giant pupil Simpsons was the way they should look. It best fit how they were starting to act anyway. The only question that remains is why do some of the secondary characters' clothes change colour all the time? They're cartoons, they aren't allowed to have varied wardrobes. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, whenever you notice something like that, a wizard did it. As Anavision and Rough Draft got more experience, their accents were toned down, so by season 7, most episodes looked indistinguishable. That is, except for the digital ones. I went over this in a previous video, going over the collective evolution and adoption of digital ink and paint, but for the skinny, by 1995, technology was catching up to The Simpsons and how they looked. However, this wasn't the first time they'd been coloured via computer. Some of the later Butterfinger commercials were animated this way. Digital Season 4 is cursed, I tell you. Cursed! If you are looking for trouble, you found it. Yeah, just try me, you- oh! All good things must come to an end, however, and The Simpsons' golden age is often stated to have been cut short during Season 9, and for good reason. A few important directors left or took long breaks here, and the new directors encouraged the show to get even more on model, somewhat robbing the characters of their expressiveness and the backgrounds of their hand-painted quality. For me, the golden age ended when they stopped giving the clouds outlines. Ironically, the writers and producers were moving the stories in a more cartoony and unhinged direction, so there's a tonal discordance at play, like either the writing's too weird or the animation's not weird enough. The colours have gotten brighter, but that wasn't a creative choice as much as evolving camera technology. Telescene, or video transfer for the first eight seasons, was mostly handled by Unitel Video. Then it was handled by Editel Video for season 9, 4MC for seasons 10 and 11, and level 3 from season 12 to whenever they stopped needing to transfer it to video at all. This is why season 10 and 11 look especially vibrant, while 9's this odd in-between of the classic and later looks. Another company to come and go was Anavision, who left after season 10 as they were merging into Sunwoo Entertainment. Now it was just Acom, Rough Draft, and a loosening tether to reality. As the 2000s dawned, most cartoons were throwing away their colouring pads and began painting digitally full time, but The Simpsons held on to cells as long as it could. Seasons 12 and 13 saw a few experiments with digital colouring, but kept to tradition until early into season 14. The show has never quite looked the same. Everybody, look at the much needed rain. Thank you, God. Now turn the rainwater into wine. The switch to digital wasn't too rough on The Simpsons, at least not as rough as we remember. Some of the colors are a bit muted, and the line art is much thicker than we're comfortable with. But if this is your favourite look for the show, I can see why. They tried to stick to their roots by giving all the characters and objects cell-like shadows, 
which are way more noticeable nowadays with the Blu-ray and streaming upscales. Not so much back then, but the attention to detail there was earnest. Something I think the season 14 directors got right was staying eager to push for interesting sequences. As awful as the strong arms of the Ma is, I really like this dream Marge has with the Vortex. You could only imagine what the earlier dream sequences could have been like if they were made in a less restrictive era. It's not just the dreams, there's the army of homers and clones, 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 the mirror maze and the dad who knew too little, the requiem for a dream homage and I'm spelling as fast as I can. These ones could have been achievable earlier, but they had to have been easier to correct and perfect now. And since the teen era was a very funky period of the show writing-wise, you could thank or curse the directors and animators for keeping the show alive. Even the folks over at Toon Zone Entertainment, who animated two episodes before shutting down. Matt Groening even said in 2006 that, creatively, there was no end in sight. Because of how the show had turned into a mirror of contemporary western pop culture, it was always going to have something new to parody, and that could sometimes involve dabbling in a new art style or animation medium entirely. Or movies. I won't go over the Simpsons movie for very long, but it would be apt to point out that it marked a dramatic increase in production values, from the orchestrated score to the script that spent years in the oven, and yes, cleaner animation than ever before. I'm not going to say the movie is anywhere near the best thing in the franchise, but there is something to be said about something this slick, big, and cinematic being a lot of casual viewers' reintroduction to The Simpsons. The increase in CGI is pretty easy to notice these days, especially since the show still likes to stay 2D as much as it can, and once you know their favourite trick is the panning shot, you can't unknow it. I still love this movie, I can live with the pacing and inconsistencies, and I'm really happy that after all these years, they still trusted David Silverman the most with the world of Springfield. Second name in the credits. Matt still gets top billing. And free popcorn at the premiere. This show will be broadcast in HDTV. Here's how I look. Huh? <laughs> Only two years later, the show's animation would go through a similar transformation. Season 20's a little closer to the movie in terms of look and movement, but now on a TV budget, so there are more cons than pros. The reason for the change was a switch to widescreen and high definition that all of TV was going through in the late 2000s and early 2010s. The show had to look cleaner and crisper than even the movie, mainly so it could stay marketable. A third iteration of the intro was well overdue, since by now going from the season 2 intro to 2008 animation for the couch gag and back to the old animation for the TV was getting really jarring. But there were many nagging issues with this new intro, due to it being animated so quickly and cheaply. Some of the added gags were fine, others sort of ruin it and make it too fast paced. Some people like to point out that the animation of Marge swerving around here has way less frames, but how is that more distracting than Maggie and Gerald's fists moving like a PowerPoint presentation? The animation in the new HD episodes wasn't quite this problematic, but it could still be argued that by now, it looked way too sterile and synthetic. Matt Groening's charming, hand-drawn style had gradually morphed into one that aimed to be as safe and marketable as possible. I always think of this promo image they used for a calendar one year, with three sets of The Simpsons on the couch. One set of Olman Simpsons, and two sets using the quote-unquote current designs. But one has the rougher old-school look, and the other the stiffer New Age look. I had a hard time telling the Marges apart, okay? Really, the only ones better fitting now were the background artists, who now had way more sight gags to cram in with the 1.7 million extra pixels they were given. Further developments to The Simpsons animation have been gradual, but you can notice a few differences between a Season 20 episode and a Season 34 episode. There was a period around the 22nd season where Acom replaced all the black line art with brown line art, but it was so thin now that you'd have to be a lunatic to notice. Dreams and parodies had become fewer again in this era, since they'd reached the point where the writers were doing whatever the bloody well wanted with the cast. So to flex that the show was still worth being animated, they started hiring guest animators to do the couch gags. They'd slowly been getting longer and more elaborate, and for a while in the 2010s, they became a mini-animation festival. Bill Plimpton, Sylvian Comet, Don Hertzfeld, Eric Goldberg, a lot of neat faces. They went back to Plimpton the most frequently, I guess because his hand-drawn charm was well needed in the HD era. 
but they had an ace up their sleeve, even more animation experiments within the show than before. We all remember the buzz around that Lego episode, but you also have them imitating the look of Wallace and Gromit, Coraline, Despicable Me, and themselves from the Tracy Ullman days. It only goes as deep as the designs in Twisty Mouth though. A massive change occurred in 2016 with the start of season 28. The Simpsons ended its 24 year stint with Film Roman and began design and layout at Fox's very own animation division, where it's handled to this day. It's still outsourced to Acom and Rough Draft, but you can tell the artists back home have a little more control over how each individual episode will look. A lot of praise has been directed at Matt Selman recently, who's co-run the show for two years now and encouraged a way more freeform and experimental creative environment than in a long time. But there should still be props to the directors and animators for getting their crazy ideas from script to screen. They aren't necessarily the names you hear as often as Al Jean, Matt Selman, or even David Silverman and Mark Kirkland. The former's a consultant now, and the latter stopped directing in season 31. The oldest director still on board as of season 34, Bob Anderson, joined in season 5. It's a new generation of talent bringing to life the most ambitious Simpsons episodes in years, probably decades, and they're doing their jobs as well as they can. Animation is a harder industry to work in every year. The Simpsons is a harder show to keep fresh every year. The odds are stacked against them, but they certainly haven't given up. This isn't exactly an endorsement of modern Simpsons. I keep an eye on a few things, like when they move a character arc forward or try to mimic the early look to pretty good results but I don't have as much interest with keeping up with the new stuff as other longtime fans. The first 8 to 10 seasons and the occasional home run afterward are enough for me to keep watching and enjoying The Simpsons, and Godspeed to the new recruits for season 35 and beyond. Whether it be a weird couch gag, a wacky face, immersive setting or witty reference, this apparently soulless husk is going to keep inspiring new animators, that's what we need to keep entertainment chugging. Once again, we just have a cameo. Don't complain or they'll put us in four by three. Oh, they're doing it now! 